Okay. Um, as a start, do you mind saying and spelling your name, please? My name is Jerry, J-E-R-R-Y, Jacobson, J-A-C-O-B-S-O-N. And uh, to get us started, can you just give me a, a brief autobiographical sketch? You can be as elaborate as you'd like, but just kind of where you're from, what you've done, what you're doing now, where you've been. I'm an 84-year-old uh, retired psychoanalyst, born in uh, Bronx, uh, New York, in 1928. Uh, uh, had education in, in uh, various parts of the country. Uh, ended up with uh, psychiatric uh, residency in Topeka, Kansas, and then moved to Boulder, Colorado with my family in 1958. Uh, have uh, three children, now grown, and six grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. Uh, my late wife uh, uh, died four years ago. Uh, okay. Yeah, you want more? I no, that's no, that's fine. Um, so why don't we go back? We'll we'll loop back around to the present. Um, but first, let's go back to the Bronx when you were a kid. Do you want to just talk about what was the setting? What was the neighborhood like? Who was there? What What are your most vivid memories of of the the neighborhood where you grew up? The it was a, a, a lower middle class neighborhood, mixed uh, uh, Irish, uh, Italian, a fringe of uh, African American neighborhoods that touched on the peripheries and and uh, the, the, whose kids attended the same public school I attended. Uh, I uh, uh, attended a, a grade school that was a, a four or five story uh, uh, building uh, that was within walking distance uh, uh, and the, the neighborhood kids all gravitated toward the school like, like a school of fish swimming upstream at, at school time. Uh, often came home for lunch and there would be a sandwich or some snack at home. Uh, the uh, we walked the streets as little kids pretty freely uh, in contrast with uh, with current practice in in New York, which wisely looks in on kids much more closely. Uh, we uh, you know, made for the most part you know, made our own fun. We we uh, built uh, you know, little scooters out of uh, uh, skates and uh, a vegetable crate and a. A discarded piece of two by four. Uh, we played street games, Rigolivio and stick ball and, and uh, punch ball. Uh, we would wander down uh, the the, uh, the Harlem River was about a mile and a quarter away. We would wander down, and there was a romance of watching the river and the New York Central trains coming by uh, around uh, 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 skirting the uh, the river uh, contours. Uh, we uh, we would often wade, or not often, but occasionally wade in and and uh, catch crabs that that had wandered close to the shore, and we'd build a fire and, and roast uh, Harlem River crab, whatever was contained in them. Uh, and then uh, you know, another incident of the of the uh, indicative of the times. Uh, once while we were doing that, a, a hobo walked by and noted noted that we were cooking crabs and. He, he said, do you have any Mickeys? Uh, to which we said no, not having any idea what he was talking about. He said, "I, you don't know what they are, do you? And we confessed, no, no, we didn't. And he walked away, which uh, he said something like, you, you got to have Mickeys, and walked away in what we thought was disgust. Uh, but uh, he came back in a while with an armload of potatoes, and that's that, that was what the Mickeys were. It was years before I made the connection that he was talking about Irish potatoes with uh, with that, it's not a it, uh, it's not a word that was part of our vocabulary. But in any case, he joined us, and we had uh, uh, roasted Harlem River crab and, and uh, Mickey's uh, roasting under the under the fire. Uh, we would also uh, you know, cross over to the Broadway Bridge and go to Baker Field and watch uh, Columbia practice football. At, uh, uh, Played uh, uh, 
Bring Alivio was a was a, a, a group game with, that involves you know, chasing and capturing. It's kind of a a, a, a military exercise and it, involving evasion and capture and and containment of the of the captives in a in a demarcated area while you seek out the rest of the other team. Uh, in the summer, the police athletically put on uh, programs that I often participated in softball paddle ball, uh, swimming, uh, that kept the kids off the streets uh, uh, in, the, in the summer. Uh, we, uh, uh, my father, in order to maintain the family, my father worked uh, seven days, uh, typically. He was a butter and egg. And he was, he was from where? Uh, he, he was from Lithuania, uh, a, a town that he lovingly Oh, referred to as Grinkichik, which uh, turns out to be a diminutive for, for Grinkishkas. Uh, but his eyes always twinkled when he talked of it, and he described it as, as having uh, he's surrounded by forests. And it was, it was clear that he had a, a, a love for his, uh, for his early life there. He, uh, when he was uh, uh, not quite 13, the family sent him off, uh, as Jewish families tended to do in Eastern Europe, uh, lest he be uh, captured and conscripted by, by Cossacks who uh, roamed and, and raided Jewish communities and would conscript uh, young bo- sturdy young boys on the spot and uh, carry them off to uh, uh, serve in the, in the army and presumably to, to uh, be used in, in assaults on, on other Jewish communities. So they sent him, uh, as a sign of their desperation, they sent him to live with an aunt who had been uh, 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 she had lived in Russia and she and her boyfriend had gotten into big political trouble through communist activities so they had escaped to Paris and uh, my father at, at 12 and a half or 13 was sent off to join them in, uh, in Paris and it was always emphasized that he joined an aunt who was living in Paris in free love, and that was always said uh, salaciously and with a rolling of eyes, making it seem like a very attractive, a very attractive state. Uh, did he, I, did he absorb any of the politics of her situation? No, I, uh, I I got most of that from his youngest sister, who was born in this country and, and was herself involved in communist activities, uh, and. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to. I can't remember exactly when I first learned why they were in Paris and not in Lithuania or mm-hmm. or, or Russia. Uh, and he uh, he. I don't think my father ever uh, said anything about it, in, including the free love part that came from my mother and aunts who uh-huh. relished that piece of, uh, uh-huh. of uh, drama. And your mother was also from an immigrant family. Yes, she was born in Hoboken, in New Jersey. Her uh, father was a tailor from uh, uh, Eastern Europe uh, from what uh, uh, an area roughly called the Kurland, which includes Eastern Germany, uh, some of the Baltic countries, and Poland. So it's, it's unclear uh, what exactly, what part of it they came from. Uh, he died uh, six weeks before I was born. He was a tailor, what they called a fine tailor, uh, meaning upscale clothing, uh, in, in Nobokin, died of tuberculosis, which seems to have been the fate particularly of tailors. I'm not sure if it was harbored in, uh, in fabrics or in, uh, in the threads and wetting the, you know, wetting the threads to, to uh, uh, get them through needles, but uh, it was not, unco- not an uncommon fate of, ta- of tailors. Hmm. Uh, before his, uh, a year before his death, uh, the, the doctor recommended that they go to altitude, by which I suspect the doctor meant something like National Jewish Hospital in Denver, but the, the family understood him to me just getting up higher, so they moved to the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> he, he tried his luck at 300 feet, and it, uh, it, it didn't do the job, and so he, he, uh, he died, and I, I am named after him. He was Jakob Schatz. I was named Jacob Jacobson. Uh, Jerry being a nickname that, that I took on early in the, early in life. Uh, my gr- uh, uh, grandmother, who survived him, 
uh, belonged to an organi a benevolent, an immigrant benevolent society called the Kurlander Ladies, and her life revolved around that, and, and uh, 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 that was her identity, and that was her her, her belongingness was with the Kurlander. Well, that was like a Landsmannschaft, or yeah, it it was a more a, a burial society. And a couple of times a year, they put on entertainments. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there would be a, I remember a violinist once uh, performed. Uh, a magician would come. Uh, I think his name was Paul Ritz, maybe. That sounds too good to be true, but it was something like that. Uh, it gave, it did magic trip, tricks for us uh, at, the, at the meeting. But my grandmother, in conversation, would always bring it around to the Kurlander uh, organization. Uh, once I came home from watching Charlie Barnett and his band, and she was living with us at the time, which was also common in, in the, during the Depression. We had an aunt live with us when she lost her job uh, uh, at a cosmetics uh, sales counter. And my grandmother moved in with us when she was sickly and, and uh, you know, couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't get by on her own. Uh, the, the, so I, I came home one day while she was living with us, and she asked where I'd been. I said, I, I went to a show, and she said, what did you see? And uh, she spoke very limited English, but uh, enough to carry on the, the conversations. And I, I understood Yiddish better than I could speak it, but I could understand her most of the time. Uh, I told her, oh, I saw a band. She said, well, what band? I'm thinking, what will she know? And I said, well, uh, it was Charlie Barnett and his band. To which she, with a, a, a sigh of relief and recognition, says, Oh, little Charlie Barnett, I know his mother, Mrs. Barnett. And I said, Well, good. So he's placed that he's okay. The years later, I read that Charlie Barnett was born on, the, on, on the, the Upper West Side in, in New York, a very wealthy family. And I'm sure his parents were, uh, if they were Jewish, I don't know, but they certainly weren't cool unders. Uh, <laughs> but that made her feel at home when she could place him in that. In uh -huh. that old country uh -huh. context. Uh -huh. So I interrupted you before. So you're, you're roving around the city, you're going to the river, you're catching crabs, you're roasting Mickeys. Um, your father was running a small butter and egg business. He, he was a salesman for a, a, a company. It was first called uh, Honig and Klein. And then uh, in 1934, uh, I thought he went to a whole other uh, company, which was known as the Marvel Egg Company. But when uh, my historian son helped me do some research in the in the microfiche of the uh, phone books of New York, it turned out that they were both at the identical address in the Lower West Side, uh, a few blocks north of uh, the, the site of the former trade centers, and and. Uh, uh, two blocks east of the uh, West Side uh, Speedway, uh, in a in a place where trucks from the country, from New Jersey, Maryland, uh, Long Island, and so forth, would bring eggs and uh, in to be uh, sorted and and uh, and delivered. So six days a week, he had what he called his route in in the Bronx, which were those grocery stores that were his customers, and uh, for six days he would go around from one to the other. And take orders, and when I was not in school, uh, I would I would sometimes accompany him on on uh, on those. And, and uh, was he driving, or was that a yes. wagon? It was he, yes, was, he driving. was driving. Yeah, he would drive, and and so he would go into a store, and so sometimes I'd go in with him. Although that usually got pretty boring for a kid, and it was long conversations in Yiddish and bargaining and so forth. And I, I would wait out the conversation, itching to get out to the next place. I don't know why, because the next place would be a lot like this one. But nonetheless, uh, I had certain signs. He, he often, as it was nearing the end of a conversation, he would say, "No, so, I'll so, Mister So and So." And I knew that the relief was was on the way, and we get in the car. And then, come lunch hour, if I was lucky on a good day, we would go to Horn and Hard Arts, and I would put nickels in and get a sandwich and so forth. And uh, that was always kind of a celebration of the two of us. We, we were very warmly connected uh -huh. during this time. Uh -huh. And what was your mother doing during these years? Uh, uh, early before I was born, she had a knitting shop there where she sold yarn and did, uh, I think, gave lessons for knitting. Uh, by the time I uh, was born, well, now that I think about it, 
uh, my older siblings were six and eight years older than me. So I think probably when my uh, brother, six years older, started school, maybe that's, I think that's mm -hmm. when she had a yarn shop. Uh, and then I believe I was not particularly planned for or expected, and so that ended the yarn shop, and she was back in the in the mothering business. Uh, uh, so she was, you know, mainly a, a you know a homebody. Uh, she was uh, she read a lot, and she also was a crackerjack uh, crossword uh, doer, and once won a prize. Uh, one of the newspapers ran a contest for crossword puzzles and, and uh, she won and, and got a little uh, five or twenty five dollar gold piece and uh, was on the radio to receive it and I remember I was maybe four or five years old I remember listening to my mother on the radio uh -huh. so she was a, a worldly figure for me for uh -huh. that moment uh -huh. but mostly she was a neighborhood lady. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What was your sense as a kid of your family's displacement. I mean, what was it like being the American-born kid of an immigrant of in an immigrant household? I, I imagine most of your friends, their parents were also immigrants. Uh, mixed, decidedly mixed. Uh, my closest friend from the time I was six to eight or so was uh, was Russian, uh, non-Jewish kid, uh, Patty Takarev. Uh, uh, there were, uh, and, and but also plenty of, of Jewish of Jewish friends. But it was it was quite a mixed mm -hmm. uh, you know, group of uh, of uh, kids. Did you have any sense of your parents' old world past, or what that meant, or what it meant to now be here in New York? Uh, interesting. As I say, my you know, my father, my father's eyes would twinkle. Uh, uh, when he talked of Grigachek and I would ask him questions about I remember once we were on a ferry going to New Jersey and I asked him how big the boat was that he came over on and and uh, he looked at the, looked the, the ferry up and down from front to back and said uh, it was about this about this size and I, I was impressed with that so I was curious uh, he didn't volunteer too much about it whatever I would think to ask I would I would get an answer to but uh, he he had uh, he left his uh, uh, he, his orthodox Jewry and his old countryness. He had tried to shed it and become American. Where that foundered was that when his kids were more American than he was, there was a discomfort about that. And uh, you know, why do you care so much about baseball? What's this with baseball? And that's all I hear from you boys. And so uh, there was that 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 uh, he wanted us to be American and, and to succeed. But he did. He would like us to resemble shtetl kids a little more, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I was aware of that. Uh -huh. What was your awareness of? So you were about four years old when the the crash came in twenty nine, and then grew up. I mean, really, your formative years were the depression years. Absolutely. Um, first of all, what did that look like? You know, in your neighborhood, in your household, but also, when do you think? was the first time you understood that you were in the middle of a kind of cataclysm mm. yeah. or was there was that only it, in retrospect it, yeah it it uh, it never felt like a cataclysm at the time partly th there was not a there was not a tv you know with constant trailers and logos saying <laughs> uh, you know, the financial crisis uh, so we knew that times were were hard uh, i knew I, I, I felt that uh, when I would see uh, you know, hobos uh, you know, coming and, and, uh, and you know, uh, looking for meals, uh, I, I always had a sense, not alarmed, but just a sense that if, uh, if a couple of grocers dropped out or my father had a bad week or two, that, that we could be on the fence, but always feeling just like we took uh, my grandmother and my aunt in, that somebody would... would Take us. I never felt alarmed. Uh, you know, surprisingly enough, I I did know that we had a savior uh, in Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and we listened to his speeches and took comfort that things were going to turn around, mm -hmm. things would get better. But uh, it was a, a sense of things are this is the way it is, not a sense of alarm that you might expect. And I, I think if there were, if there were TV drumming drumming up some effect, I think it might have gotten uh, uh -huh. a higher pitch. Uh -huh. Your parents were were FDR Democrats. The, definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
uh, almost with, I mean, it was not, without question. It wasn't even a matter of, of choice. And similarly, my brother and I and my uncles were all Giant fans uh, because that was part of being a Democrat. The, the Yankee fans were, were Republicans and had uh, uh, lived at a different level of society. Uh, but we, we always had the sense it would come out all right. Uh, uh, this may have been folly, but that was the, the, the sense that it, it's not urgent. It's not a, an emergency. It's, it's, it's bad, and we have to keep an eye out. And, and clearly, uh, uh, well, it, maybe this would illustrate once uh, uh, the Borden's Milk Company had a deal where for 38 cents and 120 buck stops or milk bottle caps or something, you could get a milk truck with lights that worked, which was quite a novelty. You had a little switch on the side, and so you could roll this truck around the floor, and, and the lights were, I was about four, and I had one, and I was very pleased with it, and I would go into a closet where it was dark, and I'd roll it around with the headlights on. And then there was a family gathering and uh, an uncle who was never particularly kind to me, uh, or my brother, uh, showed up uh, with a box and he said, this is for you, and he gave it to me. I, I, I opened it up and there was another Borden's truck. I now had a fleet. So without a sense of irony or of, uh, of, of blowing a whistle or just out of sheer enthusiasm, I said, oh boy, it's another one of those 38 cent Borden's trucks. <laughs> and my uncle, as I say, was not very patient or forgiving, so he was he was mortified that I had identified the bargain that he did, that he brought. But but so but it was important that, that the money slips in there. I think indicates my four year old sense of the depression. That's something that I didn't think that was puny at all. I thought that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, I remember some experiments I read about her, uh, in college that kids drew pictures of quarters and half dollars that varied in size depending on, on what their family income was and that poor kids drew them bigger. I huh. think a 38 cent truck was a big deal. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How important were the, the Depression and New Deal years to your own kind of coming of, coming of age kind of politically or coming to consciousness politically? How would you describe your political education? Yeah, it, it uh, well, I, I, it certainly uh, engraved early a sense that that uh, uh, people were not poor because they were uh, slovenly or not ambitious or or didn't apply themselves. That it's it's something that happens, and and we as a, we together uh, address it and and uh, and try to do something about it. And you know, th this was was. Uh, uh, you know, certainly, uh, uh, Roosevelt and uh, Fioretto LaGuardia, who, who was a, a well-disposed Republican, but but uh, but also a, a hero uh, in the family, uh, they uh, dealt with poverty as issues that were collectively to be dealt with, and so that became part of my the political DNA. I think right back then, and never uh, you know never left me that that the, the first order of things is to get everybody up to the starting line. And I, I saw school as doing that too. It's funny, but nowadays you, the, there's so much criticism of public schools and uh, 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 you know, kind of brutal criticism sometimes about, uh, uh, about that. Uh, then it was seen as what prepared us to succeed in America. Uh, as in, in my, I'm speaking in my father's terms, that, that's what it would be, and I felt that that way too. That this is this is the ticket to get us somewhere, uh, and and uh, uh, and that the notion of doing it together was an added quality. It did not detract from it. Uh, it was as compared with you know let's say a lot of people I've met in the later life, particularly in the in rural Colorado, where being self-made is important and ignoring what the society offered as though that detracts from you. Uh, as a kid, uh, I think all of us kids had the, the sense that we're doing this, that we're doing this together. We may compete with each other, but uh, there's a sense that that, that society was supporting us as a, mm -hmm. as a group, and so that would extend then to to disadvantaged people, to you know the poor, uh, people of people of color. 
uh, 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 automatically our sympathies were with labor and and uh, uh, people that who were at a at a disadvantage. Uh, now this sometimes was annoying to my to my father particularly, who felt that we we should attend more to the Jewish plight, uh, uh, and he saw that he saw the two big distractions to him that were leading us astray were, were baseball and and concerns about about color and, and social class issues, secular issues other than ethnic, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ethnic issues and loyalty. Mm -hmm. Which were, he saw how? Like what, were, what was the thing that you were doing that he was responding to? Uh, the, the uh, well, you know, later when, you know, as, as a teenager I would, I would uh, join demonstrations that were, you know, protesting, uh, well, as, as a, Sixteen-year-old, uh, when uh, I went out to uh, to Ann Arbor, there was, a, there, was a, there were protests of the barbers who had refused to cut uh, African American hair because it dulled the scissors, and they didn't want to they want to have to do that. And so I joined students that were that were picketing and, and uh, you know, protesting, and uh, he would he would not be pleased by that or or proud of that. The uh, 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 somewhere in here, I, I also should uh, indicate the, the, the Father Conklin influence, which also was part of the part of the molding of, of my political DNA. That where I was on the receiving end of being uh, uh, an enemy because of my uh, Jewish background. F uh, Father Conklin produced a, 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 a poisonous newspaper every week called Social Justice. Okay. Names were just as ironic then as as now. At, uh, named uh, ironic but without irony, uh, and so my neighborhood uh, Catholic kids, kids in my class, would sell the newspaper on street corners, and often uh, uh, came out every Friday. And on Friday, on the way home from school, part of the ritual was to be stopped, and they they would ask, "Are you Jewish?" Which the, you know, there were temptations to, to try to slip by, but we could never allow ourselves to do that. And so the answer was always is yes. And then there would be, "Well, you killed Christ," and and uh, uh, I would protest that I didn't even know him and it wasn't there. And and then there'd be some some fisticuffs, just you know, knocking each other around a little bit until it would kind of peter out. And then I'd, I'd go on home. So it was. It was clear that we could be on the receiving end of that kind of treatment, and that that gave me empathy for other groups that were that were frowned upon, and they were particularly uh, you know, people of color. I just felt great sympathy uh, uh, for them as a as a little kid. It just seemed like just seemed natural to, mm -hmm. to understand their the plight. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned that you went to Ann Arbor when you were sixteen. You were very young. And what, so that was 1942. Well, let's see, uh, uh, 1944. Four, I, okay. I had a year at City College. Let me think. I had a year at City College in 1944. When I left for Ann Arbor, I, I was not quite 17 yet, uh, uh, or maybe just was. I forget what, what part of June I uh, moved uh -huh. out there. So you were young, but you had already had this kind of, of at least inchoate, political education um, as a kid. Um, when, when did you understand the war and, and what it meant? The, uh, or what did you, or better yet, I mean, what, what did you understand about yeah, it? Yeah, the, the, we knew that it was a huge threat. Uh, we followed the papers every day. Uh, 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 some kids kept maps with pins. I didn't do that, but I certainly looked at the maps every day, the maps of Europe, maps of Battle of the Bulge, maps of... Uh, and, and it just seemed uh, a natural. Uh, that, uh, 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 now that did have a, a, a sense of alarm, not, not, the, not the full court press of alarm, but the sense that knowing that these people really wanted to take over the world, wanted to take over our world, and it was, it was in danger. But I, I guess there, was, uh, there must have been a sad sense of confidence, I haven't thought about it now, but that, that in, the, in, the, in the long run we would, we would win. And mm -hmm. there, there was a sense of pulling together and drawing together that was uh, stirring and, and touching even then. 
when you'd walk outside my apartment building, it was five stories. I think there were something like 80 families in it. And there were probably somewhere between 35 and 50 stars in the window, some of them gold and, and uh, for, uh, for deceased veterans, uh, some of them red, white, and blue. But people hung them up in the window. You could just look at a house and see our involvement. And so all these people are, are, uh, are fighting on, on our side. And, and we're producing tanks night and day. And we're producing material. So there was a, a, a real sense of uh, a pulling together in which we would be unbeatable. When we had a sense that, that our enemies were being led solely from the top by force, that we were pushing up from the bottom that we were you know, all participating in. And with great pride, uh, you know, we, we grew vegetables in an empty lot nearby, some of the kids did. Uh, all of us collected tin and, and, and newspapers and, and uh, uh, we were pleased to take them to deposit points. And my group of uh, model makers and I were all asked by Civil Air Patrol to make uh, s a scale model to a certain scale that they specified balsa wood models of uh, uh, enemy and, and uh, allied aircraft and p uh, paint them black, spray paint them black. Spray paint? No, I don't know that there was spray paint. I think we must have had a brush black, uh, lamp black on so that they, they could be held in front of a white screen to train spotters along the coast. And so we felt we were participating in, and uh, we're in this war effort to deal you know, uh -huh. uh, So the, the, the sense of a group pulling together is uh, you know that's so palpably uh, you know, lacking in so many quarters now that was, it was well. I was going to ask. I mean, so that was more than sixty years ago. Um, have you experienced anything like that on a national scale since? No. No, I, uh, I'm trying to think. You'll get a burst of it when there's a hurricane, when the, you know, when there's some uh, flood. Uh, there is that sense that at least regionally people pull together, and, and people at a distance may you know just send some money and, and uh, address it that way. But nothing like the whole country uh, you know, pulling together, and certainly the the uh, the, the uh, several wars uh, since then. Uh, have been marked by quite the opposite, you know, by the sense that some are pulling and some are pulling again. So it's been much more a, a divisive rather than than, uh, than unifying. Mm -hmm. I mean, then there was really a sense it was not a soul. Well, it's not true. I didn't know a soul who was opposed, but I know that there were you know, people that were like that. Father Kogman was one of them who felt, well, I think that Hitler gets a lot of bad press and, and he's misunderstood and I think he's onto a, a right idea, was Kogman's argument, that it is the you know those Jews that are wealthy are cornering all the money in the world, and those that aren't are have anarchist bombs and are threatening us that way. So, uh, uh, but it, it was a small voice that mainly uh, attracted teenage and and preteen Catholic boys and gave them an excuse to have a couple of fights and you know, pick on somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, so there wasn't really serious opposition at the at the a local neighborhood level in Congress. I know that there were people who, who did fight uh, our involvement and so forth. But uh, it, it, walking around the streets or into shops, we all celebrated more together. We went, when when things were going our way, uh, everybody would respond to good news in the, in the morning paper. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, uh, the, you know, the way people nowadays might respond to. Being told that that you know the the rainy season's over and yeah, we're in for good weather or something right. like that it's a shared right. or or the you know that the Mets won it was like that. Mm -hmm. Well, you um, you talked about your kind of foundational confidence during those years that in the long run things would be okay. Do you think that that was that was temperamental on your part or was that something about the setting that you were in? Yeah, I think I think it was both. You know, I think they met each other. I. I, I probably, I, I, or undoubtedly, I'd say I, I have more of that than many. I just tend to also be optimistic. I have no idea where the hell that came from, mm -hmm. but that seems to be part of my DNA. So, so I soaked up the group sense of confidence and and uh, you know and group support. So I, I I think I probably was idiosyncratically at uh, uh, at, uh, 
uh, at the high point of the curve uh, compared to other people. Uh, but I think it was there for everyone, the sense that we're in this together, and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, there's high stakes, and and, and uh, uh, just the anxious looking at the newspaper every every morning to see where is that line, what's happening with the islands in the Pacific. There was another one falling, and there was a time where, the, where they were falling one after the other, and it did look like uh, we were headed down a, 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 you know, a really serious road. But uh, there was reason to worry. Uh, but I think generally th there was a, uh, you know, as you say, a foundational confidence, but I think I had a, a stronger foundation mm -hmm. for some reason. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to fast forward then to the 21st century. We can go back and pick up some of the, the interim decades as needed, but let's, let's jump forward, especially on this issue of, of high stakes and either confidence or the lack of it. How does... How does the country look to you right now? And can you talk a little bit about what the last several years uh, have have been in your experience of, of what's going on in the country? Well, I, I think you know, the sense that we had back then as a, as a group, I think, as a country, was anybody could be in the shoes of the guy who was panhandling meals. Uh, now... Uh, uh, a large part of the country seems to look upon that as a, as a failing, as a, uh, a lack of gumption, a lack of initiative, or lack of application of oneself, uh, much more judgmental of people who are at a disadvantage by a large segment of the population. So I think those of us who uh, you feel kind of, uh, socially responsible as a group uh, are probably... Uh, uh, swimming upstream now, whereas uh, uh, back then that was the tenor it seemed mm -hmm. everywhere that we we can do it, we can get the job done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When Obama first took office, there was a lot of talk about who he would turn out to be. Would he be another FDR? Would he be a Jimmy Carter? Would he be? the kind of Ronald Reagan of the left. Um, what's your view of, of who he's turned out to be and how would you characterize these years of his presidency and, and both kind of what he's done as a leader but also the, the kind of, of opposition and backlash that he's been faced with? Yeah, I'd, I'd say my, my expectation was the same you know, overblown one that many enthusiasts had that he would be somewhere between uh, uh, an FDR and a, and a Democratic Ronald Reagan, uh, that he would mobilize, that he was so articulate, that he would mobilize. And also a, a sense that turned out to be mistaken, that in, in electing our first black president, we had crested some wave, that we had passed some point and, and were now on a, on a plateau. And that turned out to be anything but in, in terms of the... the uh, uh, you know, angry, uh, not accept refusal to see him as a citizen, refusal to see him as American. Uh, uh, that w was, uh, well, I, I warned you, I'm, I tend to be more optimistic than many. I certainly never expected that much. I, I know enough to know that there's going to be a backlash to anything, whether it's Roe v. Wade or, or, or the first uh, black president, but I, I, I really seriously underestimated what that would be like. Uh, and so he has, uh, you know, he's fallen short of my uh, fondest expectations and hopes. Uh, every now and then I remind myself, and now I have at home a, a list of 50 accomplishments that are really pretty major things when you line them up, but the emotional impact has been that we're losing, that we've been losing ground, in, that, you know, that uh, the, the, what he stood for has been being chipped away and fought at every turn. And I, I empathize, I don't, I, I uh, you know, Roosevelt had his enemies, you know, they, the, the, uh, uh, I even got a, a, a little weekly reader in school that spelled his name wrong. They spelled it Roosevelt, R-O-S-E, making it sound a little more Jewish. And some even called him Rosenfeld because he was interested in in, uh, in uh, uh, 
uh, taking Germany on, uh, Nazi Germany on in, in, in war. So uh, he, he was fought, and he had people in Congress that were fighting him every step of the way, particularly uh, the, the anti-civil rights people. Uh, and I remember he developed a chant. There was Martin, Barton, and Fish, and they were three uh, Southern uh, Democratic senators who fought him, uh, all the bills that he was trying to get through. And he developed it into a chant, and he would end a speech by repeating that what we have only one thing in our way, Martin, Barton, and Fish, and the crowd would join in, and it became a, a group a, a group chant. So he had his enemy, but I, it was it was different. It was not like now, where, uh, for, you know, for instance, a, a Congress sits on its hands for an entire term of, of, of office, uh, voting down everything, even things that they had initiated. That kind of spiteful disregard uh, is new to me, uh, even from the recent past, uh, even people that I disagreed with heartily politically seem to care about the country and the world, and now that seems to be shelved by a uh, you know, big percentage of, of the group that's that's uh, you know fighting and refusing to accept Obama as a yeah. uh, president. Yeah. Well, a couple of questions here. So yeah. one, so you you remember Father Coughlin, you remember McCarthy, you remember the kind of right-wing formation during the Cold War years, Goldwater to Reagan. Are there, so one question is, are there, are there any lessons from, from that part of our past that kind of help us understand where we are now and how to deal with it? That's one question. Well, let's start with that. Well, that's a, it's a hard one, obviously, no surprise to you, uh, because these people were outliers then, and identified as such. So we w weren't then confronted with what seemed to be a mainstream recalcitrance to, to be responsible for the country and the world. It, it, it were, it were uh, outliers taking pot shots. So there, the ways to deal with them, I don't think, are of help in knowing how to deal with, with this massive uh, group uh, a joint effort to thwart a president. Uh, that's, that's new and I, I, uh, it would call for, for new techniques that I, so I don't know whether we have lessons from then uh, that, would, that would apply. And, and, and in those years a victory was a victory and you would expect there to be grumbling and resistance to pushing it too far but when an election was over, it was expected that when you won an election, it meant something and that you would get a certain party a program through and the minority would then, or the, the losers of the election would, would then bargain with, well, we'll give you this if you give us that. And, and that seemed to be the way democracy works. It was not quite the deliberative democracy that, that uh, uh, Obama envisions, but it was approaching that. It was more discussion. And now, it, 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 the, the, uh, the, the, I don't know how many votes have been taken in which there's been a monolithic no, but it's been huge you know, for uh, three and a half years now. Right, and the use of the filibuster, 200 and some times. During, yeah. I think that was during the, the, first, two, the two, first two years of the, of the administration. Yeah. So, so the, the, the second or secondary question to that then is, um, how do you parse this out? I mean, how much of what we're seeing is the kind of logical extension of the kind of polarization that we began to see in the Clinton years? I mean, Clinton was impeached, after all, you know. Um, and, and then there's just that incredible divisive 2000 election. So you could, you could kind of predict that tracing that out another decade, that we're going to be in a kind of a bad place. Yeah. How much, how much of, of what we're seeing in the, the polarizations of partisan politics now is attri attributable to that, and how much of it is race, do you think? Well, yeah, I, that's, you know, that's another... Uh, uh, well, you're not here to ask me easy questions, are you? The, the, uh, uh, but when you think about it, uh, or not as I'm thinking about it, the... We lost an election in 2000 that a lot of us saw as crooked and cooked up and, and decided in an unconstitutional or, or non-constitutional way. And even the Supreme Court seemed to acknowledge that this was a one-on and not to be taken as a, uh, uh, you know, as a, a template for anything else, uh, which was their own way of saying how bad a decision it was. Uh, but 
we compromised with Bush. Now, regrettably, and you know, we gave him, he won, uh, we didn't like the winning, and that was more in tune with what I've been you know, describing as the past mode. You won the election or stole it, however you got it, you've got it, and so our country needs us to... And we expect you to govern. We expect you to govern, and we'll get the most of what we can get, but we're not going to throw ourselves in front of the train to, to stop it. And so so this is totally new to me, you know, and, and the filibuster is a, good, is a good measure of it that when, you know, from the time I was a kid, okay, Southern Democratic senators would be expected to filibuster anything about civil rights, and, 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 uh, but they, they, they could be bargained out of it. They, okay, I won't accept that, but they'll accept this and, and let something pass. But the filibuster as, as a, a, you know, an anvil forever pounding on every bill, that's, that's new. It's a, it's a, a new kind of uh, uh, bad blood that, uh, uh, in which governing, uh, you know, as you're saying, governing is not the point. The point is stopping and, and uh, uh, delegitimizing a black president. So I'd have to say that, that race must be huge. Uh, Occasionally, it leaks out. You know, people will say things like, I, "He needs to get off the basketball court and 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 uh, uh, tend to the business of the country when we need jobs." Uh, but don't take me out of context and say that that's racist. Uh, so there, there are some giveaways that that that's there in a lot of people. Uh, uh, I I I don't know uh, if there are people who separate in their mind race from opposing democratic goals, uh, but. The fierceness of it and the monolithic quality of it suggests to me that there's a huge something or other uh, operating under the surface, and, and that's often where racism lurks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm suspicious. So it's now mid, mid June, 2012, and already the uh, the general election has pretty much been dominating every every 24 hour news cycle for weeks, if not months. Uh, and we're still several months out from the election. This itself is new. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, so what, what is your expectation uh, for what we're going to see between now and November? Um, in terms of how the race unfolds, in terms mm -hmm. of how the issues are being framed, and, and also, I guess, how you see the coming election, what, what do you think we're in for? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm terrified about the coming election, optimism and all. Uh, uh, because uh, this should not be a contest. Uh, we, uh, uh, Obama, who has accomplished with against huge opposition, he's gotten certain extremely important things done and accomplished anyway, uh, with no help whatsoever, no pulling together, no sense of a country that is trying to solve problems. Uh, and he, he's running against a man whose era of decency he is disowning day by day the, the things that he did, like he was apparently a halfway decent governor, but he has to discard it in order to please the group that he's hoping to vote for him. So essentially, we have a, an empty suit running against one of the most articulate and, and uh, bright and knowledgeable, uh, constitutionally informed presidents that we've ever had. So that that's even happening is is uh, you know, something to to uh, frighten one. And the other thing is that you know the power of money and of thirty second spots exists only if most people are disinterested and only listening with one ear to what's going on. I mean, for most of us, a thirty second spot is not going to change our mind about who we vote for, where we stand. But apparently, this the money being poured in, you know, through Citizens United mechanisms, uh, is sways people. Uh, and that's another cause for concern that uh, that people are in, are tuned out enough that when they'll tune in disinterestedly, if somebody's yelling loud enough about uh, Obama's perfidy, it will tend to be believed, even if there's no fact behind it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a uh, people used to have more sense 
of what people stood for, knew that there were differences, and and uh, we would be you know partisan and pull for our people, and even as as kids in the class, there were were, were you know kids who were anti Roosevelt and kids who were pro Roosevelt, and we would argue and so forth about it, probably with, with great ignorance, but we knew vaguely what, the, what what we stood for, you know what each of those people stood for. Now it would be hard to say what uh, 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 Mitt Romney stands for, except. He's the, the only or best chance to defeat Obama must be defeated because he's, uh, because he's so black or because he's so dangerous or because he's uh, so bad. Muslim communist. What, what is it? Muslim communist. But, uh, if, well, yeah, there is that. that that's, that's <laughs> well, so, I mean, one question is, um, how much of this do you think, and from your experience, I mean, what, so there's an argument that, that part of what we're seeing is that the natural kind of logical conclusion of a media landscape in which there is no longer a kind of broad shared set of data that we can all interpret and argue about. So the argument goes, just to shorthand it, you know, when you have three networks, you get a public debate that looks one way. And when you have 150 cable channels on the internet, you get a public debate that looks a whole different way. And that it's not a matter now of arguing over policy, it's everyone has their own their own data actually yes. and we're living almost in a well kind of somebody said the post factual world in which if you're if you're watching Fox News you you literally are living in a in a different society than if you're watching MSNBC how much of 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 the intransigence of our politics do you think is attributable to that is this technology driven mm. or or are there other layers to it that are as important how would you how would you see that yes. having lived through these different you, yeah. you know the the radio era the the broadcast tv era and now the new media era yeah you know there, there were always uh differences fierce differences over interpretation of the uh, you know of, of the facts but but there was an agreement on the, on, on the facts, and now uh, you know, I I tend to to it's facts and and narrative narratives that that put a context to, to facts that are that that makes them be convincing in, you know, in, in themselves as as convincing as new facts is the narrative that you put it in, and and uh, Fox has its narrative that uh, makes huge sense to people who watch that only. Uh, and people who watch Fox tend to watch that only. Uh, I watch MSNBC mainly, little little NPR and and uh, 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 you know other the, the main old networks and and CNN. Uh, so it, it's very hard to argue over a piece of difference without getting into the whole narrative. It's it's uh, you know much as uh, Israel and Palestine can't discuss what's the best way out of this now without going back to you destroyed my olive fields or uh, uh, well you took our biblical land away from us and and uh, we belong there that that there's no no way to argue that out it's a implacable narratives and that so uh, is the implacability it, it's got to be influenced by uh, the existence of channels that can afford to present only one point of view when there are three networks they competed for listeners, and so they had to broaden. Now they get a certain slice, and they have to remain and hold on to that to that slice. So that that does tend to add, I think, to the implacability of the of the narratives and the and the set of facts that become relevant then in that in that narrative. Uh, but as to I mean, what, fundamentally, what caused us to lose the sense of being a country pulling together? Uh, the, the, you know, uh, disagreements about uh, the wars, beginning with Vietnam and certainly Iraq, uh, 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 led to, it to uh, uh, situations where, like, we didn't want Bush's bad ideas and ill-considered invasion of a country that wasn't involved in 9/11. Uh, there, there was, it, it, it's not a war that should be won, and that, and that it really, as it turns out, of course. It was a war that could be won, uh, and you have the uh, Republicans tending to to. I mean, they've been a little more bald about it. I want I want Obama to fail. That's my goal is to have him fail because 
what he wants is bad for the country. Therefore, as a patriot, I want it to fail. Well, we've we've never uh, dared say that about a, any any president that we want them to fail. We might want them to be in trouble where we'd have a talking point in the next election, but that's as far as it would go. We wouldn't want the country to go down the drain. And and now that seems to be irrelevant. We have let it let it go. We I mean, like the current unemployment. There there are hundreds of things that could be done if you were in a problem solving mode. But if you're a, a first, first of all and foremost, we want to defeat Obama for the next election, then letting letting things go downhill is the is the logical way to do it. And, mm -hmm. uh, how do you answer that? How do you combat that? So, is there anything that, in your view, Obama can do, should do, should have done mm -hmm. from the bully pulpit that that might address mm -hmm. this this the kind of Structural features of the landscape that he's that he's looking out upon. I mean, can he, I guess another way of putting it is: is there a way that, if you were he, that you would intervene in the narrative, as mm -hmm. it were? Like, is there a different kind of story to be told here? Well, the irony is he he can intervene in the narrative much more effectively than me, or I think ninety eight percent of the population here, the, because he is he's highly intelligent and articulate and. And, and can do it. Uh, I, I think he, he is now more openly doing things that might have been, had more effect on the narrative earlier. But he, uh, I mean, if there's anybody more optimistic than me, it must be Obama, who, who felt that if he conceded this or that and didn't uh, make a nasty argument of it, that he would have cooperation. And I think he took much too long to realize that this was implacable. And, and so he had ended up looking a little foolish or a little weak for trying to seduce somebody who, who has already announced that they're not seducible. Uh, so that was unfortunate. And I think there was, there was a time where he, he had you know, more control of Congress and could have gotten things through in a hurry. Uh, uh, so, I, 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 so that's irreversible now. I mean, he, he did wait. Now he's, he's coming out much more free-swinging with with you know a narrative and, a, and an agenda, but I don't know how much this can can uh, uh, you know impact a, a, a population that that comes to to uh, uh, look upon him and say, well, yeah, he didn't get much done. Look at that; he's been three and a half years. Uh, why would another four years you know help? And it, you know, I cringe when I hear that, but you do hear it, and, and it's 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 understandable, especially if, if what you've been listening to is Fox that implies. That the reason we're not getting anywhere is his recalcitrance or his uh, Muslim communistic uh, excesses that have to be combated, and that thank God we have patriots who have been able to to keep his wheels from turning. Uh, it's going to be uh, hard to turn that around uh, now. Mm -hmm. I hope it can be done. I, I, I uh, uh, if we lose control of of. Uh, uh, the Senate, and, and if we lose the presidency, I, I don't know what our future would would be of a, this kind of divisive, assaultive uh, approach on, on, uh, uh, to governing my way or mm -hmm. or you're an enemy. Mm -hmm. um, Occupy Wall Street was a breath of fresh air. For a minute there, um, and and very high profile for several months, has been kind of dormant. Although I mean, I know on the ground locally in various places there's still stuff going on. Um, how important in the long run do you think um, that phenomenon has been to to this election cycle? Did uh, did Occupy Wall Street or has Occupy Wall Street made a difference in the in the national discussion in a way that you think? Um, has legs. The the uh, I I I hope so. Certainly, the ninety nine percent and the one percent has stuck in our vocabulary. That has to be a healthy thing. Uh, it doesn't seem to have the immediate impact that you would hope for. That that one party seems to be looking out exclusively for the one percent and saying that if we take care of them. Uh, that everything else will run uh, smoothly and well, even though we have eight years in which they had free reign to use their approach, and three and a half years in which they've been throwing sand in, in uh, the gears of Obama's approach. 
uh, but it it, uh, it it hasn't had the it, the, the impact that seemed promised at, at, at first, but at least it's being in a vocabulary now that everybody knows what we're talking about when we say the one of the 99. Now, apparently a lot of the 99 think they're on the verge of becoming the 1%, and that's a problem, the identity problem that uh, I remember uh, uh, way back when, when Al Gore was running, uh, a, a young man in his 20s was, was called into a a talk show that was kind of a neutral radio talk show. I forget which one it was, but it was not uh, uh, avidly either uh, either side. And and uh, uh, he said he said to the, uh, the show host, "Well, uh, Al Gore is is uh, telling me that he'll help me rent a better car. George Bush is telling me I'll be able to buy one." And it was clear that in his eyes, he was going to. Uh, you know, Become a very wealthy man, and, and so the one percent ninety nine would not hurt him in the least. So, so that's a problem we've got. It, but I think that we're even talking about it uh, freely, and people understand it. That's a, I think, a lasting you know, uh, 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 change that that the, the uh, Occupy movement wrought. How much difference that'll make, uh, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, one last question: You um, you were trained as a psychoanalyst. This yeah, is true. That is true. Um, how how do you think? What are the ways that that informs your own analysis of these kind of broad social and political developments? Well, that, that's interesting. I, uh, it it uh, it it does inform. Yeah, you know, of course, ev- everything I think is somewhat you know has that in the background of. Uh, my, my experience and, and training, and, you know, what I learned in being a psychoanalyst for 50-some years, uh, enters into who I am, uh, and it works two ways. One uh, is, uh, uh, if, uh, I was walking with friends one day uh, a couple of months ago, and I, point, I pointed out or made a case that people tend to feel that uh, Republicans are more adult and safer even if they show up at meetings on, on health care with guns strapped to their thigh, it's not alarming. Or even if they blow up the Murrah building, it's not, it's not alarming. It's a, or if they kill abortion providers, it's, it's, it's okay, it's contained. So there's kind of an adulthood that goes with that. And, and whereas Democrats are seen as unruly and messy, and when are you going to clean up your room, kid? Uh, and and don't get the benefit of that. And when they get unruly, when we get unruly, it gets scary. And right away, cops come in. And you know, there was that UC Davis, that hideous spraying. They, they they would never spray a young Republican meeting where they showed up with guns, to, to saying guns belong on campus. They would never get pepper sprayed. So there's a certain license that goes with that. And so one of my friends, uh, who I didn't know so well, he was joining us, said. Well, you know, that's a psychoanalytic theory, isn't it? I said, well, I guess so. You know, but to me, it was life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure it, you know, it enters in that way. The other thing is more paradoxical about it. In my work, I have people who are committed to change. And people who are committed to change and trying to remove internal obstacles to it, personal responsibility is the coin of the realm. That's the lever that makes it work. And so there's, there's been a kind of contrast between my s- social view uh, of needing to get people up to the starting line. I mean, I, in certain ways, I'd be more consistent if I were uh, right-wing uh, and could say across the board. I think everybody needs to step up and take responsibility. So I've had to make that division that somebody who's committed to change and throws himself into a process then can be called upon to, to make the... The ch- you've got something. Yeah. Well, it's just interesting to me that you would put it that way because another way of looking at it is to say that that Republicans have cornered the market on on personal responsibility the same way that they've cornered mm-hmm. the market on patriotism and the flag and all these mm-hmm. other things, which none of which is true, but it's but it's framed in such a way mm-hmm. that so they have actually a very narrow and very particular definition of what mm-hmm. social responsibility or what personal responsibility has to mean. There are all kinds of other equally mm-hmm. important ways of seeing what could be packed mm-hmm. into that phrase, and I think that you buy into many of those, right? Yeah. So it's just interesting to me that yeah. you would you would seed that ground. Yeah, yeah, right. That's it's a very good point. 
uh, I still think there's something in it, but I, but it's got a fallacy in it too. I think you're right that I have been accepting a, a bill of goods, but the, but the you know, the notion, uh, well, I guess maybe the very notion that helping somebody up to the starting line uh, is uh, counter to personal responsibility. Uh, that that may be what I bought into because uh, that's how it's viewed. Is uh, you know we we give unemployment insurance it just induces unemployment we give welfare it just induces more welfare, uh, but in point of fact you often have to begin a, a therapy by getting somebody up to the starting line and so before you expect them you, it's like a mini society in a sense mm -hmm. that you have to do a little welfare or or uh, uh, you know some some. Uh, you know, helping to get to a point where personal responsibility right. begins to make sense, right. and in that sense, then that would that would be consistent with a, the, uh -huh. the social view that, that at some point you do have to look to people to provide. But the, if they're not ready for it, then uh, condemnation is not particularly helpful mm -hmm. or therapeutic mm -hmm. or societally useful. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah, yeah. but I, I mean, I guess the best example of what I'm talking about is the way that that. Um, Obama's health care plan, the, the, the mandate has not been framed as a personal responsibility issue, right? Which it yeah, is. Which because, it is. because absent that, then the mandate is for all of us to pay for whoever shows up at the emergency room who's, I mean, that's, that's a yeah. mandate, right? And yeah, it's a costly right. one. But it's not framed that way. And, and it's because Obama has not grabbed hold of the personal responsibility part of the argument that is actually the whole undergirding of his plan. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's funny. I, part of his his timidity, uh, or even timidity or, or eagerness to compromise when he started out, you know, it would seem to me if he'd started out by saying, let's expand Medi Medicare by five-year increments. Let, let's, let's lower it to 60 and let's do zero to 12. Uh, Medicare type. I, I don't know how much fight there would have been, but uh, uh, there would have been some fight because that cuts insurance companies out of it. And so, but I think that's a, a battle that might well have been won had he been more bold and and more uh, ready to take on unilateral you know, arguing. But once he accepted that it, that companies belong in it, uh, and then you're going to demand of the company that they not consider risk. Uh, which is part of any insurance policy, then you have to have a mandate. And, and then I, I, I see where you're going with that, that that, that was then uh, run with as, look how they're trying to force us. Tyrannical. And, and right. but now the guy forces us because he lies on the front steps bleeding, and, mm -hmm. and so we're forced to, to we're mandated mm -hmm. you know, to do it. And that, could, that case could have been made, but I think even a step before that, if, if he had used Medicare that everybody feels congenial and knowledgeable about, Mandate they picked up on a on a fear and it, I think there's a, a saying I don't know where it comes from that that people who stand to lose something are much more vigorous in fighting than people who might stand to gain some unknown something mm -hmm. and as soon as he talked about health care plan people began to love their insurance companies I mean, up until then you heard nothing but anger, resentment, they are intrusive, they block, they have gatekeepers, they're awful. And suddenly they became lovable and he's going to... Well, because they were better than his death panels. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. No, they were, really. <laughs> but they were right down to So fear, yeah, uh, the, the injection of fear into every public issue has been part of the poison in the, in the system that yeah. seems to justify... Uh, the you know thoughtless, irresponsible blocking of governance, because mm -hmm. governance would be worse. Is the right. implication of the, of the argument? Right. A couple of years ago, I interviewed an artist named Ricardo Levens Morales, and one of the things he said, he was talking about Obama and the presidency in general, actually. And he said, "They never, people never, people will never remember what you did. They will only remember how you made them feel." And I thought that was that's actually now I'm just in light of what you were just saying. I feel like that's that's actually a psychoanalytic insight, but it's yes, a really it it's a really brilliant one. It is because I mean you could explain the legacies of I mean to just contrast two really sharply different individuals, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. Hmm. That 
dictum seems to explain everything about who we think of as... as There's a malaise afoot in the land. doesn't make you feel very good. Mourning in America is, is great. And as somebody who, who would sit and bask in the, in the fireside chats of FDR, you know, I mean, when, when he said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, it was, oh yeah, really, that's wonderful. Well, let Obama try, try <laughs> to good sell that one. That, yeah. In now. yeah. Well, this has been great. Is there anything that we didn't talk to talk about that we should have, or that you feel like you wish you had said? The, no, that comes later. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, I, it's been enjoyable to have a chance to you know, look at this landscape and the yeah. way that you, uh, you know, nudge it and and frame it. And it, it's uh, no, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Great. Well, thank you. 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 Thank you.